have them today. Uh, join me again in welcoming them today. Shalom uvoker tov. Hello and good morning. We're very happy to be with you this morning. We thought that perhaps you'd like to hear a little Hebrew, the language of the Holy Scriptures. They say that if Moses went to Israel tomorrow, he could read the morning paper. I don't know if that's 100% correct. But certainly he could understand a lot. But also you know some words in Hebrew. <laughs> but you didn't know? Hallelujah, they amen. Words like hallelujah and amen. But you also know some words in modern Hebrew. Words like radio and television. Taxi the tractor. Taxi and tractor. Ketchup and mayonnaise. Ketchup and mayonnaise. You see, now you can go home and say, I can speak Hebrew. <laughs> well, it's a delight to be with you this morning. And for those of you who are just getting acquainted with Life and Messiah, you should know that uh, you have on your staff of supported missionaries, Scott and Corey Schwartz. Lori and I were just with the Schwartzes in Dallas this last week. The LCJE North America group is a ministry convocation every year of our colleagues in Jewish ministry. And Scott and Corey were among the lifers. That's how we refer to Life in Messiah International for short. We don't use our initials. We love Life in Messiah, right? That free and full and forever gift of life that Messiah gives us. So we're lifers. And uh, Scott and Corey are, and you know, <laughs> when in the first service we sang the same song that we just ended with here, Bless the Lord, O oh My Soul, I cannot hear that song without smiling, because when Scott and Corey were just coming on with Life and Messiah, and this was back in like 2015 maybe, I went out to Vermont, and Scott was still driving truck, I don't know if you knew he was a, a, a dairy truck driver, so I got to go out in the mountains of Vermont, ski country, and deliver milk products to various places. Um, I fulfilled a bucket list thing that I didn't even know was on my bucket. Um, but that night when it was time for uh, Micah to go to bed, he was, uh, I don't know, maybe four years old at the time. He's their youngest. And so he went upstairs, folks uh, read to him, prayed with him, put him to sleep, well, put him to bed. And we're sitting down talking on the first floor and I hear this little child's voice Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I said, he's singing himself. He's singing. And, the, and Corey said, yeah, he does that every night. That same song is what he goes to sleep with so he doesn't have any bad dreams. How cool is that? Bless the Lord, oh my soul. So Life of Messiah started in 1887 as Chicago Hebrew Mission, so we're still close to our roots. The headquarters moved down to Lansing, Illinois, right across from the Lansing Airport. So if uh, you're driving up Burnham Avenue and glance off to the left, you'll see a big sign to Life of Messiah. And we're happy to have you come and visit, even happier if you come on days when volunteers come to help us with mailings and things. Um, but yeah, we'd be happy to have you stop by. Our staff serve on uh, four con continents and eight countries. Uh, and our newest field is actually in Hong Kong, where Life of Messiah is incorporated, as well as in Canada. Um, Mexico and uh, up in the Netherlands and France and Argentina uh, and Israel, of course, in, here in the United States. So there's some literature there on the table. If you want to get more acquainted with the ministry, that'd be great. I'd be happy to talk with you. But when I talked to Pastor Phil, we went out to lunch and I thought it was going to be half an hour and he probably thought it was going to be 15 minutes. But two hours later, we're still sitting there swapping stories and you know, put a nickel in me, I can go all night. So stop, start your stopwatch. <coughs> and he said, I would like you to come and speak to our folks um, about God's enduring love for the Jewish people and the challenge of anti-Semitism. And I'll tell you, in 45 years of ministry, it's the first time I've been asked 
to teach on anti-Semitism. Now, I've taught on anti-Semitism a number of times, but not because I was asked, but because it's important. It's important for us to understand. And you should know that both Lori and I are Gentile preacher's kids. We both grew up as evangelical preacher's kids, me in New England, uh, she here in the Chicago area. So uh, I used to say, as far as I know, there's no Jewish blood in me, but we actually did the 23 in me, and, and guess what? I don't have any Jewish heritage uh, by, by blood, but I'm happy that I can say that I'm a spiritual son of Abraham by faith. So the longest hatred, that's one of the terms. In fact, there's a book that's been written with that title, The Longest Hatred um, About Anti-Semitism. So let me just ask to begin with, what do you think about when you hear the word Jew? Just think to yourself, what do you think about? And then turn to your neighbor and tell them what you thought, okay? This is going to be an interactive service this morning, so don't be shy. What is it that you thought about when you thought about the word Jew? So I've given a couple of visuals here just to kind of prime the pump. The first is, if you remember back in Charlottesville, I think it was, what, in 2018, when uh, all the political rage was going on and uh, there were counter marches and the KKK, the white nationalists, were walking down the street with the tiki torches, you remember this? And what they were saying is, Jew will not replace us. Jew will not replace us. And so here's a, a girl saying that uh, she's a Jew and she refuses to be replaced. And the next picture is of ultra-Orthodox Jewish people. And sometimes this is the mental image that we have because these are the most readily identifiable Jewish people. If you go to West Rogers Park, if you go to Brooklyn, go down to where the Schwartzes are living in New Jersey, uh, they're just outside Lakewood. And you have no uh, question about when you've entered into the Jewish neighborhood. You just look around and you see all the folks who are dressed as those who are pictured here. Uh, they've been in the news recently as well. In Israel, uh, for two of the holidays, there were two, two different tragedies as m multitudes of Jewish people gathered. And in the first case, they were going down a narrow um, walkway, I guess you would say, and somebody slipped and people fell and were trampled to death. And then at uh, Mount Merom for another holiday, there was... Uh, a lot of Jewish people who were standing on like a grandstand that collapsed and some were killed and many injured there. Uh, didn't make the news so much here, but in Israel for sure. And then the next picture, of course, these are the yellow badges from the Holocaust. And some of you have doubtless read many books or seen the movies about the Holocaust, Schindler's List, or, or maybe you've read The Hiding Place. Lori and I have been privileged to visit Corey Ten Boom's home in Harlem, and I've actually stood in the hiding place, and I can tell you that one shoulder touched one wall and one touched the other in this little hollowed out area behind her bed. The Holocaust is often what Jewish people are associated with. And then the picture to the right is of a modern Israeli celebration. And of course, once again, Israel's been in the news, and most specifically because of the recent barrage of 4,000 rockets from Gaza that were indiscriminately fired into Israel. Well, who's the first Jewish person that comes to mind? If you had to name a Jewish person, who first comes to mind? Go ahead and tell your neighbor who you thought of. Who's the Jewish person that you think of? All right, so I hear uh, some biblical names, right? Here's some from more modern times. Anne Frank, this is from the Holocaust, the diary of Anne Frank. Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of Israel, um, maybe up until today. He's been the longest serving prime minister in Israel's history, but there's a new government that unless he found a way to derail is going to be established in Israel today. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld, Albert Einstein, for my generation growing up, I think he was probably the most famous Jewish person. Um, then you think of Bernie Sanders, right? Uh, people who are involved with, with our political system or in the world of entertainment, Steven Spielberg, music, Barbara Streisand, uh, Maimonides, a uh, philosopher in history for the Jewish people. And then you also, of course, have famous musicians. Um, if you think of like Yitzhak Perlman today or uh, Felix Mendelssohn historically, um, Adam Sandler, Karl Marx was Jewish. 
You know, we talk about the impact of, of Marxist communism on the world. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who uh, passed away and was the reason for a lot of uh, controversy in America. And then Jonas Salk, the inventor of the polio vaccine. Do you know Jewish people are less than one half of 1% of the world's population? But more than 15% of Nobel Prizes have been given to Jewish people. And when you talk about medicine, it's 30%. Think about that. 30% of Nobel Prizes for medicine have gone to Jewish people. But the most famous Jewish person in all of time is who? Yeah, this one we should get. Jesus. Jesus, who was born a Jew, who had the Magi come to Herod and say, where is he who is born king of the Jews, who in his public ministry went to Samaria and a Samaritan woman in John 4 said, how is it that you, a Jew, talk to me, a Samaritan woman? And when Jesus died over his cross was the inscription, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. But, but over the centuries, Jesus has become Gentilized. I don't know if you've noticed in art, but a lot of times he's pictured like a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus. Now, I know there are a lot of different cultures. You can find a, a, a black Jesus. You can go to China and find an oriental-looking Jesus. And, and, and Jesus is the God of all, right? He's not just the God of the Jews. He's the God of the Gentiles also. Uh, but Jesus has a Jewish identity. In fact, that was the the theme of our LCJE conference this last week was restoring the Jewishness of the gospel. Because over time, over the centuries, the church has moved further and further away from our Jewish roots. To the point that Scott Schwartz, when he was growing up in Philadelphia, honestly thought that Jesus was a Catholic. I mean, that was his impression. But Jesus is Jewish and the most famous Jew of all kind of all time. So let's just talk quickly about a definition of who is a Jew. According to the rabbis, you're Jewish, halachically, rabbinically, you're born, you're born to a Jewish mom, you're Jewish. Or if you convert to Judaism, then you can call yourself a Jew. You're not ethnically a Jew, but you've, you've um, aligned yourself with the rabbi's teachings. So you have a biological definition and you have a religious definition which gets really confusing for people because you can, you can meet Jewish people who don't even believe in God. They're very secular, but they're very proud of their Jewish identity. And then you could also go to a synagogue and find people who don't look Jewish, have a Jewish name, but they are a part of the Jewish community because they've converted to Judaism. Now, biblically, we see not matrilineal, but patrilineal descent. All the genealogies are so-and-so, son of so-and-so, and the father's name is given. Um, in Jesus' genealogy, interestingly enough, we do have women who are, who are listed, um, but that's the exception. It's not the rule in Jewish genealogies. Well, Abraham, of course, is the father of the Jewish people, though he was never called a Jew. He is the one to whom God comes in Genesis chapter 12 and tells him to get up, to leave his, his land, to leave his hometown to leave his family and to go to the place that God will show him. And, and included in God's promises is this land that he's going to give to the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham. And then he says, I will I'll bless you and I'm going to multiply your seed. You're going to have a great nation. And that, of course, is the Jewish people, right? And then he says, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Think about that. All the families of the earth will be blessed through one man. Uh, this is an incredible promise. And it's what really distinguishes Abraham and Abrahamic faith from every other religious system. This is God's person to raise up a nation through whom the Messiah would come and be the savior of mankind. There are specific words, terms, phrases that are used in the scripture of the Jewish people and them alone. For example, the Jewish people are God's chosen. You can go to Deuteronomy 4, you know, who is like our God and what nation is there that has a God like we do? But it's not the Jewish people choosing God that makes them chosen. It's God's choosing the Jewish people. Um, sometimes you'll find Jewish people who say, well, we're not really the chosen people. If you've seen Fiddler on the Roof, you know, Tebya, when he's wrestling with God, because life is really hard, right? The milk cow is not doing so well. The horse ain't doing so good. And the buggy's, you know, got a bad wheel, you know. And it's just 
I don't know, he's trying to get home for Shabbat, for, for the Sabbath, right? You know, this is what it means to be chosen. Can't you choose somebody else for a while, right? But the chosenness is what God uses as a term. When he says, I didn't choose you because you were greater in number. You were the fewest of all peoples, but I chose you. God says to the Jewish people, I chose you because I loved you and because of the promises I made to the patriarchs. And he chose them to be a people for his own name. He sets his name upon the Jewish people. Uh, he talks about Israel as his firstborn son. That's part of the Exodus narrative. He talks about Israel as his wife. He uses a covenantal marriage uh, depiction. He also uses the word segula, which is a treasured possession. So if, God forbid, your house were on fire when you got home today and you only had a chance to rush in and grab one thing, what would that be? Whatever that is, is your segula, your treasured possession. That's the word that God uses of Israel. And, of course, we're familiar with that phrase, the apple of his eye. This is from Isaiah 43. It's just one of many, many verses in Scripture where God articulates his very special relationship with Israel. Uh, just for point of clarification, um, I said that Abraham is the father of the Jewish people, but he was never called Abram the, the Jew. Uh, what is he called? He's called Abram the Hebrew. Uh, in fact, the term Hebrew continues to be in use when you get through the Joseph story. You remember Potiphar's wife says, you know, that Hebrew that my husband brought in here, right? And then when the whole Exodus account takes place, it's Moses before Pharaoh, you know, let my people go. These are the Hebrew people. That's the nomenclature that's used early in the Old Testament. But where do we get the term Jew from? Well, if you remember, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God changes Jacob's name to Israel. So when we talk about the children of Israel, the sons of Israel, right, the nation of Israel, we're talking about the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And then when the 12 tribes are in the land after the conquest with Joshua and they grow and spread and God raises up kings over them, first Saul, then David, then Solomon, and after Solomon comes Rehoboam and he listens to the counsel of the young guys instead of the older wise men and there's a tax revolt remember jeroboam says to your tents o israel and takes the ten northern tribes and founds the kingdom of israel which is dispersed in 722 by assyria judah continues on until 586 when babylon comes comes down but the term jew begins to be applied toward the end of the monarchy and when we get into um, the time of the captivity to the exile. Uh, and when the exiles come back, Ezra and Nehemiah, now we're talking about the Jews. That's where the term comes from. And the term Israeli is used in modern times to talk about a citizen of Israel. And you don't have to be Jewish to have an Israeli passport. If you have citizenship, you can call yourself an Israeli, even if you're not Jewish. All right, let's go to the story of Esther. And because of time, and I, I apologize for this, I, I really wish there was a pause button on the clock. I mean, honestly, I do. Because there's so much richness in this text to be mined. Um, but we're going to have to fly through it. And I'm going to trust that if you don't know the story well, that maybe you'll take some time even this afternoon to read the book of Esther. Uh, an amazing story. Which starts out in Persia. So we're already in captivity, right? So the Daniel's view of the success of kingdoms, Babylon's already on the shelf, and Persia is in ascendancy. And it's a Persian king, a Hajuerus, a, a Hashvarosh in Hebrew, or Xerxes is his Greek name, uh, same guy, different names, but he's got a wife named Vashti, and when he's got this drunken party with all his guy friends, right, got this boy thing going on, and he wants to bring his wife in to entertain the troops, and she doesn't want to come, and she refuses. And because she refuses, the Lord say to the king, you know, you better not let this stand because if the queen can get away with it, then maybe our wives think they can get away with it and that's not going to be good. And so he basically dethrones the queen and has a beauty contest and who gets elected to be queen? Not elected, selected by the king, it's Esther. And we're introduced to Uncle Mordecai. Now we get to chapter 3 and we're introduced to Haman. Now Haman 
is part of the Persian kingdom, and he's one of the trusted advisors to the king. In fact, the king likes him so much that he decides to promote him above everybody else. You can think in terms of Joseph back in, in Pharaoh's day, and, and Pharaoh elevates Joseph to be kind of second in command over all the kingdom. Just think of the authority, the power, the prestige that comes with that kind of assignment. This is Haman, who has his seat above all the princes who were with him. And guess what? Just like today, people fawn over people of power, right? Uh, but this case, you know, you're actually bowing down. You know, this is a, a way of showing obeisance to this great guy because the king had commanded it. But there's a conscious objector in the crowd, and his name is Mordecai. And everybody notices that when Haman comes through the king's gate and all the lords are bowing low, guess who doesn't bow? Hey, Morty, wh why are you not bowing? And he says, I'm a Jew. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, we worship the God of heaven, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and we don't bow to any man. Oh, well, can you believe this? Can you believe this? Do you think Haman knows about this? So off to Haman they run. You know, politics has been a dirty business from long before our century, folks. Palace intrigue. Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew, so guess what? Haman, when he sees that he doesn't bow or pay him homage, he's filled with wrath. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. Oh, we know this story, and it's familiar to us. We know Haman's the bad guy, and Morty's the good guy. But, but I want you to think about this for just a second. How much do you have to hate somebody to kill him? Well, I mean, we live in Chicago area, right? I mean, our news is filled every day with gang violence, you know? A and, you know, if you really want to teach somebody a lesson, you not only kill him, but you kill maybe his wife and kids, right? That sends a message. But on what scale do you measure the hatred of one man for another man that he wants to destroy not just this family and his cousins, but every Jewish person? He wants genocide to happen. How proud do you have to be to be this angry, to be this filled with rage and hatred, to want everybody killed who's even distantly related to him? So they cast a lot. That's where we get the term Purim from, they cast poor, and a specific date is chosen. Now, Haman goes to the king. He's got the king's ear, right? He's second in command. And he says, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from everybody else's. These are a strange people. They got their own customs. They got their own laws. They, they don't fit in like everybody else has to. And they don't keep the king's laws. There's no record in the scripture that Mordecai is a lawbreaker. He won't disobey God's law. He won't bow down to a man. But he's not out in the streets, you know, picketing against the king. He's not doing criminal activity. But you see the charge. You cannot live among us as Jews. These people are different from us. If they're going to live in the kingdom, then they need to be like us. They need to adopt our culture, our customs, our language. Uh, and this has been how Jewish people have largely been treated throughout much of history, right? You cannot live among us as Jews. If you're going to live in our neighborhood, you need to become like us. And Jewish people have assimilated largely in many places throughout history as a result. But it's beyond that. He says, it's not fitting for the king to let them remain. You can't live among us as Jews. No, no, you can't live among us. You got to get rid of these folks, kick them out of the kingdom, evacuate. Oh, but it's worse than that. He doesn't want them just kicked out of the kingdom or assimilated. He wants them dead. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed. And I, I will pay 10,000 talents of silver. No doubt this guy's got his treasure chest of his own, right? Yeah, I'll write the check, he says. No big deal. I want him dead. I'll pay for it. And how does the king respond? So the king took a signet ring. He gives 
payment is credit card. He said, no, no, I got this. Go ahead, whatever's in your mind, whatever's in your heart, go ahead and do it. The money and the people are given to you. Do with them as seems good to you. So letters are going out to 127 provinces, to all the couriers, right? This is the original Pony Express. They're going out with the letters. And what did the letters say? To destroy, to kill, to annihilate all the Jews. Can you imagine getting a telegram that says, find all the Jewish people in your community and kill them? Young and old, little children, women, one day, the 13th of the 12th month, the month of Adar, to plunder their possessions. So the king and Haman sit down and have a tea party, probably a little Irish whiskey party. And the people of Shushan are perplexed. I don't get this. What in the world is going on here? Now, we talked about the title deed to the land. It's unconditionally given to the Jewish people. When God signs the covenant, he walks between the pieces that Abraham parts, the sacrificial pieces. Abraham is an observer, a passive observer. He doesn't pass between the parts. Only God is committed to this covenant. The land in perpetuity belongs to the Jewish people. But God makes it clear that their ability to live in the land with his blessing and peace and security and prosperity is conditional. Got it? Title deed, forever and always, in Jewish hands. Ability to live in the land under God's blessing, then be obedient, listen to the Lord, do what he commands. That's Deuteronomy 28 through 30. Those are the last words of Moses. So we talked about the statue of David, right, the, or of uh, Daniel. The gold head represents Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, and then comes Persia, and then the prediction of another empire, which turns out to be Greece, followed by Rome, all of those things come into fulfillment. 330, 333 is when Alexander the Great arises and conquers the world, and then the Romans follow. And then we move into AD. Okay, and now I need my balloon people. If you're a balloon person, I need you up front, please. There should be 15 of you, and our balloons are over here, and I would just tell you that I'm not sure that the ink on them is dry, so please handle them carefully. And your assignment is to get a balloon and to line up in date order, with the earliest date off here, stage, I don't know if this is stage right, yeah, your left. So you're going to have to look at the dates and figure out where do you line up, okay? So you're either before or after. So 2021 will be way over here, and if you're in the 200s, you're way over here. So just keep, keep looking at who else is showing up. Let's see, we should have used uh, black ink on 1182. I used red, hoping it would show up, but the red's faded already. All right, so while they're disorganizing here in the background, you can look on the screen and you can see how often the Holy Land has been trampled over. You know, God calls Israel the center of the earth. Did you know that? The center of the earth. And if you look... It's the land bridge between Africa and Asia and Europe. And so conquering armies have swept north and south over the years until we get to the modern state of Israel. Now I want to talk to you about Christian anti-Semitism. If there ever was a phrase that should be a non sequitur, it should be these. These two words should never be put together. Christian and anti-Semitism absolutely should not belong. I was on the streets of Brooklyn just a couple of years ago. A rabbi, an ultra-Orthodox rabbi, comes down the street. He's in his black garb, and he's in a hurry. He sees me. He stops. He said, I don't have time for you. That's the first thing he says. I don't have time for you. I just have one question. Why are you part of such a religion of hate? And I will tell you that if he had asked me that question in 1975, when I first joined what was then American Messianic Fellowship, I would have had no clue what he was talking about. I told you, I grew up in an evangelical preacher's home, and we didn't hate Jewish people. But I will tell you that I was just ignorant. I was ignorant of history. And that's why we have these balloons. This is your balloon popper. Once you pop your balloon, no, you're going to pop the balloon when I, after I'm done reading your thing. And then you can sit down and hand the 
No, hand the knife and then you can sit down. If you sit down and then hand the knife, it's going to get awkward. All right. Here we are, 306, the Council of Elvira. Prohibits intermarriage between Jews and Christians. If you're a Christian, you cannot marry a Jewish person or vice versa. Christians and Jews can't even have lunch together, and Christians can't observe the Jewish Sabbath. No way you can have a Sabbath in your home with Jewish people. 306. The Council of Nicaea. So now we have Constantine converting to Christianity, right? And we're going to have this council to try to figure some stuff out. Some important things were talked about there, but included, and by the way, the Jewish bishops didn't make it to Nicaea, apparently. Christians are prohibited from celebrating Passover. How many of you have been to a Messiah in the Passover presentation? Well, you couldn't do it, according to Constantine and his council. We're not going to have any of the Jewish stuff. In fact, we're not going to let the rabbis tell us when we're going to celebrate the most important day on our calendar. Resurrection Sunday, up until 325, you always knew when Easter was going to be. When's Easter in 2028? Anybody know? Well, of course, we're going to celebrate Easter. Well, why don't we know? Well, we have a smartphone. The smartphone will tell us. But how does the person, how does Siri know to tell you when Easter 2028 is? Somebody has to put it on the calendar. Well, up until Nicaea, we would have looked to see when is Passover on the Jewish calendar, and the first Sunday after that would have been Resurrection Sunday, um, but not after Nicaea. Now it's the first Sunday after the first full moon following the vernal equinox. Hello? Find that in your Bible. But we're not going to let a bunch of rabbis tell us when we're going to celebrate our Lord's resurrection. 325. Aren't you glad these are big balloons? All right, 347 to 407, John, the golden-tongued orator, Chrysostom, he describes Jewish people as degenerate, lustful, rapacious, greedy, perfidious bandits because of their odious assassination of Christ. Leading voice in church history, John Chrysostom. The Council of Narbonne. Sorry, I didn't have Chrysostom up there for you. Council of Narbonne. The Jewish people are forbidden to recite their prayers aloud under penalty of a heavy fine. You cannot live among us as Jews. Assimilate. The Council of Toledo in 681. Jewish people are ordered to accept baptism. You cannot live among us as Jews. If you're going to stay here, you've got to become Christians, even if we have to forcibly convert you. 1096, the glorious crusades, right? Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. And as we're marching from England across France, we stop in villages where there are Jewish people and we kill them. And when we finally besiege Jerusalem and break through, do not read the account of what happens as the blood flows in the streets as not only the Muslim infidel, but the Jewish population are wantonly slaughtered. Crusaders massacre Jewish people. <laughs> Christian France, 1182, Jewish people are expelled. You cannot live among us. 1215. Canon 68 of the Fourth Lateran Council. First time we know in history where Jewish people have to wear a badge to identify. Uh, I don't appear in public at Easter time because you killed Christ and we will kill you if you show up while we're celebrating our holiday. 1290. This is long shanks for you historians, right? Richard I expels all Jewish people from England. It took 350 years before Cromwell reversed this. England was free of Jewish people because of the king's edict in 1290. Balloon. The Black Death. Here we are, COVID pandemic. A lot of talk about the Spanish flu in 1918, but you go back and read about the bubonic plague, the Black Death. The Jewish people got blamed for poisoning the wells. Jewish people practiced a kind of... Um, 
hygiene that kept many of them from getting the plague. And so they got blamed. Over 200 Jewish communities are destroyed as a result. 1478, the Inquisition. So we know torture, execution, forced conversions, property and wealth of prisoners confiscated by the church, and thousands are burned at the stake. You cannot live. Martin Luther, Ein Festeburg. A mighty fortress is our God. Here I stand, I can do no other. 95 theses on the Wittenberg door. We know a lot about Martin Luther, but I promise you I did not know that toward the end of his life he got hardening of the heart, if not hardening of the arteries, and he wrote a little booklet called Concerning the Jews and Their Lies. This sentiment that he put into German culture continued on until the last century when Nazis said, we never said anything that Luther didn't say. Listen, advocated the burning of Jewish homes and synagogues, the expulsion of all Jews from Germany, so that you and we may be all free of this insufferable devilish burden, the Jews, you cannot live among us. Peter Stuyvesant, right? American historians now are talking about our shores. 1654. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Had a little delayed explosion there. <laughs> Feel free to pop your balloon when I move to the next slide. <laughs> Peter Stuyvesant, right? Peg Leg Pete, you remember him? New Amsterdam, now New York. Dutch colony, sent there by the Dust, uh, Dutch East Indies uh, Trading Company. So here we are, beautiful day, down at the pier, in comes this ship, and who's on board? There are 23 Jewish people fleeing persecution in Recife. These are Dutch Jews, and the Portuguese are invading uh, Brazil, so they're on their way back to Holland, but they're attacked on the high seas by pirates. And the closest Dutch port is New Amsterdam. So here comes Pete to welcome the newcomers, and here's what he says. He writes a letter back to the Dutch West Indy Company, and he says, you know, these Jewish people, they want to stay here. I didn't say Jewish people. These Jews want to stay here. We ask that the deceitful race, such hateful enemies and blasphemers of the name of Christ, be not allowed to further infect and trouble this new colony. You cannot live among us. And of course, the Holocaust. I won't take time here to recount the horrors of the Holocaust and the Holocaust and six million who died. If you haven't been to the Holocaust Museum in Skokie, um, I would love it. If you get a group together, I was talking to Jerry Laverman after first service, and he said, you know, I've never been up there. He said, you get a group from church, and I'll be glad to take you up there. Um, we need to know the history that we don't know. Uh, there's a wonderful Holocaust Museum, national one in, in Washington, D.C., and if you go with us to Israel, we'll take you to the um, one in Israel. All right. So, 11 worshipers are killed, 6 wounded at Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue in 2018, 2019, one's killed, 3 injured in Poway, California. And today, because of what's going on in Israel, there's a lot of concern about rising anti-Semitism here in the U.S. and around the world. All right, the rest of the story, so we don't have time to go back and go into... go into uh, the story of, um, of Esther in detail. But you know, the king gets royal insomnia and he's having the chronicles read to him and ironically of all the things that could have been written to him from the history of his kingdom, it's the story of how Mordecai uncovers a plot. And the king says, hey, did we award him the uh, presidential medal of honor yet? Says, no, it's not in the record, we didn't do anything. Well, we gotta do something. Hey, here's Haman, Haman, what should we do? Oh, Haman says, <laughs> Who would the king want to honor other than me? So let's get the royal horse, put the crest on him, the robe, you know, let's go out and have somebody important go before him and say, this is what we do when the king wants to honor somebody like me. And the king says, oh, this sounds great. Now you go and do it for Morty. <coughs> so 
Mordecai the Jew. Notice he calls him Mordecai the Jew. The king knew he was Jewish. So Haman took the robe, he arrays Mordecai, goes throughout the city square, and then he goes home, and he's has a basket case. He's got his henchmen, he's got his wife, and he says, I can't believe what I had to do. Can you believe this guy? And I said, wait a minute, this is Mordecai the Jew? Look, if Mordecai, before whom you've begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. And certainly he does. When the queen has a banquet, and then the next night a banquet, and Haman's the only other one other than the king who gets invited, he's back on his high horse until she says, we have been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. Look, if we had just been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. You, you lose your Jewish population? You talk about a brain drain? Just think about what would have happened if Hitler didn't kick the Jewish scientists out of Germany. These are the guys who were working on the atomic bomb. Esther says, the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Hey, Haman built this gallows to hang Mordecai. King says, string him up. And they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. So the king sends out letters. The Jews are not destroyed. Rather, anybody who tries to kill them, they should be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. And their possessions plundered. So Mordecai goes out, and he's honored once again. And many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon him. All right, so what does all this mean to us today? It's a great history lesson, Wes. So the Jewish people are important in God's sight. We get it. God protects his people. Uh, we understand. Well, anti-Semitism is a form of racism, and like all racism, is evil. But at its heart, anti-Semitism is satanic. Satan cannot arm wrestle with God. It's not like Satan and God are equal, and they're arm wrestling, and Satan's going to have a chance at winning. Satan's a created being. God's up here. He can't punch God in the face, but whatever God especially loves, Satan especially hates. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's not that he's not going to try to destroy the church. He can't. We're the bride of Christ, the body of Messiah. He's tried over and over again to destroy the Jewish people. He won't be able to. Right? Look at Jeremiah 31. God says it would be easier for the stars to fall out of the sky than for me to break my covenant with Israel. And God's very clear. Even the one who treats the Jewish people with contempt, God will curse. That's the Hebrew meaning behind Genesis 12, 3. And God's blueprint for the church, for us today, is that of the two, Jews and Gentiles, he's making one new man. If we're in a community that has Jewish people, then there ought to be Jewish believers in our congregation. And guess what? There are. Right? Brother Fernando, sitting right back here, is an example of the remnant according to the election of grace that Paul talks about in Romans. But we should have Jewish people worshiping with Gentile believers as one body in the Messiah, God's blueprint. The greatest blessing for the Jewish people is the gospel. Yes, it's, it's good to combat anti-Semitism. It's good to stand with the Jewish people. If a synagogue in Munster gets a, a swastika on it and I hear about it, I want to be there asking the rabbi, can I take the swastika off? We need to find practical ways to demonstrate the love of Jesus to our Jewish friends. But if we hold the gospel, withhold the gospel from them, that's the greatest form of anti-Semitism because Jewish people like Gentiles have the greatest need of reconciliation with the God of Israel. And that only happens by grace through faith, trusting in the Lord Jesus. If it matters to God, does it matter to me? That's my question to you. The Jewish people matter to God. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Yea, with everlasting kindness I have drawn you. Jeremiah 31, 3. We take a lot of Old Testament scriptures and we apply them to the church. And maybe there's an application of God's blessing to us, but this is God's promise to his people. 
I want to leave you with these words from Romans 11. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Blindness in part until. The blindness is partial. There are Jewish people, the faithful remnant, who are coming to faith in Messiah. And praise God, we live in a generation when that number is really increasing. The reason the anti-missionaries, especially in Israel, are being so stirred to counter the gospel, just as they did in the book of Acts, is because the church is exploding, and not quite the numbers yet as in the book of Acts, but we're praying. Because Paul says in verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved. I don't think that's going to happen in my lifetime. My eschatology says that the Lord's going to take the bride of Christ out of here, before Israel recognizes Messiah. But one day, Zechariah says, they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for the, their firstborn. Oh no, it was Yeshua. It was Yeshua. We missed it. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, Paul writes, they are enemies for your sake. They're enemies of the gospel they're not our enemies. Please don't misunderstand. The Jewish people are not our enemies. They're the victim of our enemy. It's a blindness, spiritual blindness. But because, Paul says, of their blindness, they're being broken off, the natural branches, we Gentiles, the wild branches, are grafted in. And what a blessing that is. And Paul talks about, if that was a blessing, how much more will their restoration be? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. They're irrevocable. Well, we've got the table there. I'd be happy to talk with any of you. If you want to volunteer at Life to Serve, that's great. But I'm telling you, if you will pray for Fernando and Laura and for Scott and Corey and for all who are endeavoring to bring the gospel to the Jewish people, it has been the privilege of my life. that God called us to Jewish ministry. That God give us his heart for his people. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you.